OK, good. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have a full house uh, today for a talk by Nima Amari. So um, before I do the presentations, uh, the introduction, let me go around the table uh, and say hi to everyone and see if I manage to um, put you in full screen. So our uh, first group uh, is a group led by Andre from MPI. Um, and you can see that these guys uh, know how to uh, do TCS plus events. So just two minutes ago, the thing was full of pizza, but now it, it seems like it's starting to run out. So it's time to get, um, so we have a lot of talks from uh, Europe, uh, a lot of uh, participants from Europe today, maybe because uh, Europeans are good at algorithms or maybe because the time change sort of is uh, slightly more helpful than usual. So anyways, that was a group from MPI. Uh, then we have, um, Benjamin from uh, uh, Madison. Um, then uh, there's a group with uh, Budima uh, from EPFL. Uh, some more Europeans, welcome guys. Uh, then uh, Diksha from University of uh, Toronto, welcome. Uh, then there's um, Erfan from uh, Indiana University in Bloomington, hi. Uh, then we have uh, Guillermo uh, from Uni Lisbon, uh, University of Lisbon. Uh, then there's Janish, uh, just around the corner, uh, from Caltech. Uh, Chang Kyang is joining us from Virginia Commonwealth University. Libor is joining us from RCQI. Um, I'm actually not sure what RCQI is, I'm sorry. So, um, okay, so Libor is joining us from RCQI. And uh, finally, um, we have our speaker, uh, Nima Amari, uh, joining us from Stanford. So, um, welcome everyone. Um, I should say that, um, those not present uh, here, but part of the team um, are doing a lot of work in the background. So that's Clément Canon and India Day, who is here, uh, Gautam Kamat, Ilya Reisenstein, and uh, Odette Regev. So um, thanks, uh, guys, for the help for the TCS Plus team. I'll also say before we start that the next talk, uh, two weeks from now, will be given by uh, Danu, uh, by sorry, Arthur Sumaj from uh, Warwick, and Arthur will tell us about Ron compression for parallel matching algorithms. So uh, on to today's talk now. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Nima Anari um, uh, give the talk. So Nima uh, got his PhD a couple of years ago with Satish Rao uh, from Berkeley. And then he spent a little bit of time as a postdoctoral fellow at the Simons Institute in Berkeley. And since I think one year, he's been uh, at Stanford as a postdoctoral fellow. So Nima has done a lot of work uh, on algorithms, um, including algorithms for approximating the permanent and many others. Uh, but today he's going to tell us about joint work with uh, Vijay Vazirani, um, showing that uh, the planar perfect matching uh, is in NC. Um, so welcome, Nima. Thanks. So hi, everyone. Uh, this is a joint work with Vijay Vazirani. Let me just jump into the problem. Uh, so I hope that most people here know what uh, a perfect matching is. If you're given a graph, you want to pick a set of edges such that every vertex is adjacent to one of the edges you picked. So uh, there are basically three main computational questions you can ask about perfect matchings. Uh, I've written all of them here. This talk is about the middle one. So let's go over them. Uh, so the decision problem is given a graph, does it have a perfect matching? The search problem, which we're discussing today, is uh, if the graph has a perfect matching, just output one of them. Uh, and there is also a counting problem, which is how many perfect matchings there are. Okay. So the type of algorithms uh, in this talk that we are considering are uh, in this computational model called NC. Uh, so this is the theoretical model uh, uh, for parallel algorithms. Uh, you can roughly think of it as uh, you have polynomially many processors. So the, uh, the number of processors you have is very large, uh, not a very realistic setting, uh, but it can be ar uh, as large as a polynomial in the input size. Uh, but then uh, by getting this many processors, uh, you wanna be super fast. So the running time of your algorithm uh, has to be polylogarithmic in the input size. Uh, and then all of these processors have access to the shared memory. Again, an unrealistic assumption in the real world. Uh, uh, but this is a theoretical. Whether or not you have access to randomized bits actually makes a lot of difference in parallel uh, algorithms. So uh, I have to make this distinction. C and RNCs where you don't. Uh, and this talk is about the uh, deterministic NCs. So uh, no randomization is allowed. 
So if this is a, such a real, unrealistic model of uh, computation, why do we even care about it? Uh, it all goes, uh, sorry, is the, uh, is everybody hearing me fine? Well, yeah, um, you know, we can hear you, but sometimes it gets cut a little bit. And I was wondering if that could be because you're on a wireless network. Um, and uh, so the connection is a little jumpy. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you have a cable, you can plug in right away. You can do it. Otherwise, I think it's it's fine. It wasn't. Yeah, hopefully I, I it stabilizes. Yeah, yeah, I can't do anything about it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So hopefully okay. it stabilizes. If it's really a problem, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, if if it's a problem, then in the worst case, we can always switch off the video. Okay. Case, yeah. That's true. Yeah, but let's let's try it this way, and I'll I'll ask you if if you need to uh, stop the VLC, maybe. Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. Uh, so um, yeah, so it all goes back to this. Uh, central problem in uh, uh, in uh, uh, computational complexity called polynomial identity testing. Uh, so what is this problem? You're given a multivariate polynomial in M variables. Um, the way you're given such a polynomial can be in uh, many different ways. You're some, you can assume that you're given a circuit, a formula, or even an oracle that evaluates this polynomial at arbitrary points for you. And your task is to determine whether this polynomial is identically zero or not. So there is a very simple randomized algorithm and Schwartz and Zippel were the first ones to prove that uh, this simple randomized algorithm works. Uh, and the way uh, uh, this randomized algorithm works is you just plug in uh, random values for the variables. The output is zero. All is identically zero, then the evaluation is always zero. Uh, and Schwartz and Zippel showed that uh, if uh, if you're taking your random bits, uh, if you're taking your random inputs from a, a, a large enough set, uh, uh, then we evaluation if your polynomial is not. Uh, Nima, yeah, the problem is still there. So maybe can you just close the VLC window? Sometimes this is sure. what uses most of the bandwidth, and it'll be easier. Okay. Uh, all right. Is it better now? Well, you have to speak for a while, but it, it looks okay now. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, polynomial identity testing has this uh, very simple randomized algorithm, and uh, one of the central questions has been whether we can uh, design uh, uh, deterministic algorithms for it. Uh, there are a lot of works on this problem. Uh, it's it's quite likely a very hard problem uh, because if you can uh, provide polynomial time. Uh, uh, deterministic algorithms for this problem, then you can prove uh, non-trivial circuit lower bounds. Okay. So uh, because polynomial identity testing is uh, likely very difficult in general, people have considered uh, several special cases of it. Uh, I've listed uh, three of them here. Uh, the first one is bipartite perfect matching. Uh, the way it reduces to polynomial identity testing is the following. So suppose that you have a bipartite graph and you consider it's bipartite at GCC matrix given by the AIJs. So AIJ is uh, one whenever there is an edge between I and J and zero whenever there is none. Uh, and then you multiply these by symbolic variables XIJ, right? So if you compute the determinant of the symbolic matrix, it becomes the polynomial in the variables XIJ. And uh, if you just look at the formula for the determinant, this polynomial is exactly non-zero whenever there is a perfect matching. Any, any term you get in the determinant would have uh, distinct uh, uh, variables x, i, j. So none of, there is no cancellation in the computation of the determinant. Uh, is, the, is the sound fine? Yes, so far so good. Yeah, so far, yeah, so far. All right, all right, good. So bipartite perfect matching, uh, you can generalize this idea to uh, perfect matching in non-bipartite graphs. Over there, you have to work with this uh, uh, slightly more general matrix called the Tot matrix. Uh, but again, the same reduction holds. Uh, the determinant of a symbolic matrix is identically non-zero if and only if the, uh, the graph has a perfect matching. Uh, I'll go back to what this Tot matrix is later in the talk. And then there is uh, this third problem, which is a slight generalization of the previous two. So you're given a, a graph, even a bipartite graph, and you've colored its edges red and blue, and you're asked whether there is a perfect matching that uses exactly k red edges, okay? 
So all of these problems can be reduced to polynomial identity testing. And because of this reduction, there is, there is randomized NC algorithms for all uh, three problems. Right, perfect matching and perfect matching in uh, general graphs. Uh, we already know polynomial time algorithms that don't use any randomization. And uh, these algorithms don't use this reduction at all. So it's for a completely different reason that these two problems are in P. Um, so if we really want to uh, de-randomize polynomial identity, identity testing in these three cases, we have to be working at the right level of complexity. Uh, so so asking whether there are deterministic P, type, P algorithms for uh, perfect matching is not the right question. So we have to go down one level and ask uh, whether there are NC algorithms uh, for perfect matching and bipartite perfect matching. Uh, if you are working with exact matching, then it's fine to ask the question whether there is any polynomial time algorithms because uh, we don't know uh, any such algorithm for this problem. Uh, finally, uh, there is also, you can define a search version of polynomial identity testing. So the search version would be, uh, if your polynomial is not identically zero, just give me a monomial whose coefficient is non-zero, right? Uh, in, the, in the three problems I mentioned, this, this, these reductions basically uh, uh, also preserve the search version. So if you can answer that for, for polynomial identity testing, you can answer that for bipartite perfect matching, perfect matching, and exact matching. Uh, there is a very general technique called the iso isolation lemma that basically also solves the search version of all of these things in uh, randomized NC. So, so this is the main reason we are interested in this question. So here's a brief history of the algorithms uh, found for perfect matching, um, uh, parallel algorithms for perfect matching. Uh, so Lovage was the first one to show that this, uh, there is a randomized NC algorithm for the decision problem. And then later Karp, Upfall, and Wittgerson showed that even the search is in uh, RNC. And then a year later, using this uh, very general technique called the isolation lemma, Momuli, Vazirani, and Vazirani gave a different proof uh, uh, for why search is in RNC. And then uh, over the last couple of years, there has been renewed interest in these problems uh, because of this amazing discovery by Fenner, Gorger, and Thierof uh, that uh, if you slightly relax your definition of, N definition of NC and allow for not just polynomially many processors, but uh, quasi polynomially many, uh, then uh, search and decision, uh, both of those problems can be solved in quasi NC. Uh, and then this idea was later extended to uh, general non-bipartite graphs by Svensson and Tarnovsky. Okay. Uh, by the way, if, uh, if you have any questions, just uh, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, uh, so this talk is about uh, the special case of planar graphs. Uh, so why do, we, why do we consider planar graphs at all? Uh, in general, uh, this decision search and counting problems for uh, perfect matching are perceived to be in the increasing order of difficulty. Uh, the reason for this is uh, both search and counting, uh, I mean, decision can be reduced to both search and counting, so search and counting must be at least as difficult. And uh, for general graphs, counting is uh, known to be sharp p hard, whereas the previous two are uh, in RNC, or, uh, or even in uh, uh, polynomial time, okay? But for polynomial, uh, but for planar graphs, uh, there has been a, uh, for, uh, for planar graphs, it's been known for a long time uh, that counting can be done in NC. Uh, so this is a result of Castellane and then Vazirani uh, uh, generalized this to a slightly more general class of uh, graphs called uh, uh, K3, 3, free graphs, okay? Uh, but the, the search version was still a question mark. So we know polynomial time algorithms for it, but no uh, deterministic parallel algorithms, okay? Uh, I should mention that for the even more special case of bipartite planar graphs, uh, it was known that the search version is in NC. Uh, so the first proof of this fact appeared uh, in a paper by Miller and Naur, and then uh, later, uh, Mahajan and Varadarajan gave a, a very different proof. 
Uh, and our algorithm is actually uh, inspired by this work of Mahajan and Varadarajan, so I'm going to go over it in details. Um, okay, so this is formally the result that we obtained, that there is an NC algorithm for finding a perfect matching on planar graphs. Okay. I should mention that since, uh, since our result, there has been two the uh, Sirani have uh, generalized this to uh, to a more general class of graphs uh, called one minor crossing free. So this includes planar graphs as well as some other graphs. Uh, and then uh, Sankowski has uh, shown an alternative algorithm uh, for the same problem, uh, and he has already he has also shown that uh, the 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 relevant problem of uh, maximum cardinality matching in bipartite planar graphs can also be solved in NC. So in general, uh, maximum cardinality matching, there's a reduction for it to, uh, to uh, uh, perfect matching, uh, but the reduction uh, destroys planarity in general. Uh, so this is, uh, this is why uh, the second uh, result is non-trivial. Okay. All right. Uh, so why are there matchings in them? Uh, so, how do you count perfect matchings in a planar graph? So let's consider a bipartite planar graph for simplicity. Uh, you have an adjacency matrix. It's a bipartite adjacency matrix. So the rows are uh, show the vertices on the top, and the columns show vertices on the bottom. There's a one whenever there is an edge. And this is exactly the, uh, the quantity that you want to compute. Uh, the permanent of this matrix is exactly the number of perfect matchings, right? So permanent is, in general, uh, sharply hard to compute. So it's not clear why uh, planar graphs make it easy. Uh, and the, there is a, a similar quantity to permanent that we can uh, always efficiently compute, and that's uh, the determinant. So there is a superficial similarity between the determinant and the permanent in that uh, you have, you're summing over the same terms in both, but in the determinant, all of the terms appear with uh, either a plus sign or a minus sign. So there could be cancellations here, right? So Polya uh, was the first person to ask this question. Uh, when you are given a 0, 1 matrix, can you maybe uh, change some of the ones to minus one so that the determinant becomes the permanent of the original matrix, right? So, so in other words, you want to change some of these ones to minus one so that uh, all, all of the signs here become plus, okay? So that there are no cancellations. And uh, unsurprisingly, uh, for uh, bipartite planar graphs, you can always do this. That's the reason uh, planar graphs are special. So, so if you're working with non-bipartite graphs, you have to work with a slightly more general matrix called the TOT matrix. So this is a skew symmetric matrix, uh, uh, meaning that its transpose is it's negative. Uh, so for so here, uh, the rows and the columns are both all of the vertices in the graph, and whenever there is an edge, you put a plus one on one side and a minus one on the other side. So you have a choice here. Uh, whether to put a minus one on the top and a plus one on the bottom or uh, vice versa, okay? So uh, what we know in general about the Tot matrix is that its determinant is very related to the perfect matchings. So it's a sum over perfect matchings uh, of some particular sign. Uh, the sign is determined by the way you chose the signs. Uh, and then the whole thing is squared. So again, if you can manage to find the signing, uh, assigning so that there is no cancellation in the sum, uh, you can compute the number of perfect matchings by computing the determinant and then taking the square root. Okay. And uh, this is what Castellan showed that in planar graphs, you can always choose the signs in the adjacent in the tot matrix so that there are no cancellations. Okay. And then uh, uh, Shanky had shown that uh, you can compute the determinant uh, uh, in NC using parallel algorithms. Uh, and so this gives you a way to count the number of perfect matchings uh, in NC. Uh, Nima? Yeah. So if you're trying to compute the permanent of a matrix and uh, the underlying zero non-zero pattern 
is actually, let's say, a bipartite planar graph, is it easy to then compute the permanent? Yes, yes, exactly the same signing gives you the same. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's not it's not uh, necessary for your matrix to be uh, to consist of plus ones and minus ones. Uh, you can have arbitrary coefficients as a, and as long as the uh, non-zero patterns form a planar graph, you can do this. All right. So so we can count in planar graphs, but does but how does that help search? Okay. Uh, so for this, I'm going to go over the algorithm of Mahajan and Varadarajan. Uh, who used counting to solve search in bipartite planar graphs. Okay, so, so roughly the sketch of their algorithm is the following. Uh, you find a point in the matching polytope. So what is the matching polytope? It's a polytope whose vertices are the indicators of all perfect matchings. Okay, uh, so this is a pictorial uh, depiction. Uh, so you find this point that could be in the interior of the whole polytope. The vertices of this polytope are basically all of the perfect matchings. And then from this point that you found, you, uh, you, you move to a lower dimensional face. And then from that lower dimensional face, you move to an even lower dimensional face and so on until you reach a vertex, okay? Once you, okay? So where does counting uh, come into the picture? Counting is exactly used in the first step of this algorithm, okay? To get the initial point in the perfect matching polytope. So if I wanted to compute uh, the average of all of the vertices of my polytope, which is by definition in the convex hull, then I could use this trick. Uh, so think of an edge E and count the number of matchings, perfect matchings that contain that edge E and divide that by the number of perfect matchings. So this gives you some number between zero and one. And if you consider all of these numbers uh, for all of the edges, uh, this is exactly the average of all of the indicator vectors of all perfect matchings, okay? So you can use counting to find that starting point. And then the rest of the algorithm of Mahajan and Varadarajan doesn't use counting anymore. Rest of the algorithm goes. Uh, so uh, so the polytope that I mentioned, whose vertices are all the perfect matchings, in the bipartite case is, uh, it's a very yes, simple uh, polytope. Nima? Yeah. Sorry, one more question. So so you use this counting algorithm to find an initial point in the interior of the polytope. Right. And when you go to a lower dimensional polytope, do you again like invoke the thing or is just one no, call? No, no, no. Just one call at the beginning of the algorithm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll... So Nima, just... Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Just clarifying on that. So, how do you, how like this step by step should take too many rounds? How do you right, do this? Right, 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 right. Yeah, I'll I'll go over that in a okay. in the next couple of slides. Yes. So, uh, so yeah, so so this is the matching polytope. Uh, this is the this is basically the uh, the inequalities and equalities describing it. So, for each edge, you have a variable uh, describing whether that edge is in the perfect matching or not. And then uh, the first constraint, equality constraint, is just uh, telling you that each vertex must be adjacent to, a, to exactly one edge. And then uh, the second type of constraint is just that uh, uh, Xe's should be non-negative, okay? So this is known to be the exact description of the perfect matching polytope in the bipartite case, right? And how do you move inside the polytope described by these equalities? You can move using uh, this thing called the uh, uh, using uh, using an, a cycle, basically. So consider this uh, highlighted cycle here. Uh, if I add epsilon to the uh, to the even edges and uh, remove epsilon from the odd edges, then I'm again uh, I'm still uh, satisfying the first type of constraints. Okay, because at every vertex, my change is just plus epsilon and minus epsilon, so they cancel each other. Right. So as long as I can do this and uh, and have my Xe's be non-negative, then I'm moving inside the matching polytope. Okay. So you can you can basically increase epsilon on this cycle until one of the edges becomes zero. Right. Once one of the edges becomes zero, you have basically made one of these constraints tight, and you're at a lower dimensional face. So, so this way, you can basically remove the dimension of the face that you're at by one, 
right? But if you want to do this uh, uh, naively, this can take uh, polynomially many steps. Uh, so, so the way uh, you you parallelize this is you find many many uh, disjoint uh, cycles. Uh, so, so let's say in this picture we have three cycles. They are all edge disjoint, and then on each one of them you can do this operation in parallel. Okay. So, uh, so. In planar graphs, you can generally find omega and edge disjoint alternating cycles as long as some minor conditions are satisfied for the planar graph. I'll get to that conditions at the end. Uh, but that's the rough idea. You can always find rough linearly many edge disjoint alternating cycles. Uh, and then uh, you, can, uh, you can do this operation of removing an edge uh, for each one of them. And this basically uh, reduces the dimension of the face that you're at by at least a constant factor, okay? Because you made uh, omega n of these constraints tight, all right? So you rotate these in parallel, and then omega n edges disappear, and then you have to clean up the remaining graph and repeat. So this cleanup is related to what, uh, what I said about the conditions you need on the uh, planar graph. So in general, uh, not all graphs have this many edge disjoint cycles. Think of just a single large cycle, right? It only has one cycle, right? Uh, so the condition you need here is roughly that uh, the graph doesn't have any vertices of degree two, okay? Uh, so this cleanup basically gets rid of the vertices of degree two, and it's very easy to deal with those vertices, okay? So once you clean up, you again find uh, linearly many alternating cycles, and you can repeat this until you get basically to a perfect matching. All right. Okay. So what's the challenge in non-bipartite graphs? The challenge is that the polytope is now much more complicated. So Edmonds was the first person to show that this is uh, the description of the uh, perfect matching polytope in non-bipartite graphs. Uh, so uh, we have the two constraints we had before, but these are not enough. You have to also add a third type of constraint, which is saying that an odd set of vertices, so here uh, in this example, I have three vertices, any perfect matching must have an outgoing edge uh, from the set, okay? Uh, uh, this is easy because all of the internal edges uh, uh, basically cover an even number of vertices. So there must be at least one vertex not covered by the internal edges, which must be covered by an external edge, right? And Edmonds showed that if you add this third type of constraint, then uh, you have exactly the description of the perfect matching polytope. Notice that uh, the third type of constraint uh, is much more complicated than the previous two because there are exponentially many of them. Okay, all right. So how does that make uh, our lives harder? Um, so previously, we were finding a, an even cycle, which we can uh, And I can still try to add epsilon and remove epsilon from the edges of it. Uh, but now the third type of constraint might be the one that blocks me, right? So here is an example. So if you consider this graph, uh, and you put one third on all of the edges, this is a point in the perfect matching polytope. Uh, but if you, if you try to add epsilon to the uh, even edges of this cycle and remove epsilon from the odd edges, uh, then the constraint for this cut becomes violated for any epsilon bigger than zero, okay? That's because before you, you did this operation, uh, the value of this cut was one third plus one third plus one third, one, and now you're removing two epsilon from this value. So the cut would go below one, right? So, so the third type of constraint can still block us uh, and it might not be possible to remove an edge from uh, such, a, such an even cycle, right? But uh, here is the saving grace. Uh, so if you have a set, an odd set of vertices that's blocking you, uh, meaning that the cut value of it is already one, uh, then there is a well-known operation that basically preserves perfect matchings and reduces the size of the graph. Uh, so this operation is basically, you shrink all of the vertices inside the set S into a single vertex S, okay? 
So you contract your graph. Uh, and the point is that uh, if you had a point in the perfect matching polytope before the shrinking, the new point induced by the previous point uh, is inside the polytope of the new graph. Right? Uh, the reason for this is that uh, because this set S was tight, now the degree constraint for this new vertex S is satisfied. Okay. And um, there is also a second fact, which is that if you if you find a perfect matching in this shrunk graph, you can always extend it to a perfect matching in the original graph. Okay. So, so, so it seems that if I'm blocked by the third type of constraint, I can still make progress, right? So, so for each cycle, you basically go until you're stuck by one of the constraints. You've either removed an edge or you are able to shrink an outset. And that reduces the size of the graph, okay? Now, the challenge is that we want parallel algorithms. So we don't want just uh, remove. We don't want to just remove one edge or shrink just a small set, but we want to remove either many edges or basically shrink a lot of the graph. Okay. So here are the uh, the the three main ingredients that our algorithm uses. Uh, so the first ingredient is about moving inside the polytope. So before, in the bipartite case, we were doing this by moving along each cycle in parallel. Uh, I'll show you that uh, in the in the non-bipartite case, you can't uh, you can't do that uh, that naively anymore. You have to be more careful and more clever. Then there is this question of once you're basically blocked by an odd set, how do you find it, right? Uh, because there are ex potentially exponentially many odd uh, odd sets, and you can't just enumerate over all of them. And then once you find these odd sets. Uh, potentially many odd sets, one for each of the cycles that you're working with, uh, how do you basically shrink them? Because these odd sets, you've, you've found an odd set basically for each cycle, uh, but they can be crossing each other arbitrarily. So it's no longer clear that uh, you can basically shrink them at the same time. You have to somehow make them disjoint. So I'll go over these ingredients one by one. Uh, let's go over the first one. So remember that in the bipartite case, uh, you uh, we were able to find uh, omega n uh, edge disjoint cycles uh, as long as your graph doesn't have vertices of degree two. Uh, that's still true for non-bipartite graphs, right? But the cycles can be odd, right? So in this graph, we have these two cycles and they have odd length. So you can no longer do the previous operation of adding and removing epsilon because uh, if you just do that, then the degree constraints for these two vertices wouldn't be satisfied, right? So, uh, so how do you fix this? You can basically join the uh, the the cycles that you find uh, by some path. So morally, you should think of uh, two joint cycles as a, a single cycle with repeated edges. So if I'm joining these traversing one triangle first, then going over the joining edge, then traversing the other triangle, and then going back on the joining edge, okay? So this is an this is morally an even cycle uh, with just repeated edges. And if you if you do the accounting of the, uh, the, the plus epsilons and minus epsilons, you'll see that you have to basically remove twice the epsilon from this uh, joining edge. So you can still uh, move within the, uh, the perfect matching polytope by uh, uh, by these even cycles, right? But the, here's the here's the big problem: uh, if you have disjoint even cycles in the bipartite case, uh, you can move along them in parallel, and nothing goes wrong. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So here is a here is a uh, the matching poly at this central point and we've found two disjoint cycles uh, each one of them gives me uh, a movement so basically the two yellow arrows uh, show you the direction of the movement if i increase the size of my arrows until i basically hit a face for each one of my cycles then the combination of the moves uh, still uh, takes me to a point that's inside the polytope 
This is because the constraints, the inequality constraints defining the bipartite case uh, are very simple. They're just coordinate uh, non-negativity. Okay. So yeah, so moves uh, can be done in uh, parallel when your graph is bipartite. Um, but in the non-bipartite graphs, things are more complicated. The picture is more like this. So, so you can you can think of this additional uh, face as as one of the uh, odd set constraints. So now, if I have two two moves, uh, their sum no longer takes me inside the point uh, to a point inside the uh, the polytope. It can it can just jump outside of the polytope. Okay. So here is a here is how that situation happens in the graph. So think of an odd set S and uh, two disjoint cycles that basically intersect it. Now, if I find the slack for epsilon, the maximum slack uh, for uh, this set with respect to epsilon one and the maximum slack for, uh, for this set with respect to epsilon two, uh, then the maximum slack for the, for the uh, addition of these two moves is the maximum of the two slacks epsilon one and epsilon two, uh, not, the, not the addition of epsilon one and epsilon two. So if I uh, if I do my operations on these two uh, edge disjoint cycles, uh, this this set can go uh, the the constraint for this set can become uh, violated. All right. So how do we fix this? Uh, the way we fix this is by invoking the uh, the counting algorithm again. Okay. So so here is the idea. So suppose that uh, I'm at this point in my uh, perfect matching polytope and I have two moves denoted by the yellow uh, arrows. Suppose that I, I found the hyperplane uh, which basically separated these arrows from the rest of the space. So all of the arrows live on one side of the hyper, uh, hyperplane. Uh, so this hyperplane is basically defined by a weight vector W. Uh, so it's uh, equivalent to saying that there is a vector w such that the dot product of w with all of my moves is negative. Okay. Now, if I found the minimizer of w dot x uh, for this weight vector w, this would be maybe this point uh, denoted in the black. This point has already exhausted the moves parallel to the yellow arrows. Okay. Um, in other words, uh, starting from this new point, uh, this new black point, uh, I can't move along uh, any of my cycles anymore. Okay, because if I could, I would be able to reduce w dot x. Okay, so so that's the whole idea. You find a vector w such that w dot uh, the dot product of w and all of your moves is negative. Uh, and then you find the minimizer of w dot x. Okay, so here is what it translates to. So you can think of w as a weight vector on the edges, and this condition that w, uh, the dot product of w and uh, each of my moves is negative, is basically saying that for all of my even cycles that I found, the, alterna the alternating sum of the weights should be negative. Okay. Now, if I have a bunch of edge disjoint cycles, it's very easy to construct such a weight vector. You basically make the weights of all of the edges zero, except for one in each cycle. So for each cycle, you just uh, pick one of the edges that appears with a negative sign in here. You put the weight of that edge to be one, and all of the other edges, you put their weights to be zero. Okay. So this makes sure that the dot product is negative. But then, uh, how do you find uh, the minimizer of this w dot x? That's the that's the main question. So it seems like you're you're solving an optimization problem, uh, and we couldn't even find the vertex of this uh, polytope to begin with, right? The point is that this minimizer doesn't have to be a vertex. You can find a point inside the minimizer face of counting to so. Uh, so, so here is the lemma. Uh, if you have, if you put weights on the uh, edges of the uh, the graph, as long as the weights are bounded by some polynomial in N, uh, then uh, a fractional minimizer of w dot x can be found in N C. And the way you find that is by counting the number of 
minimum weight perfect matchings. Okay, so similar as before, except that everywhere uh, you replace matchings by minimum weight perfect matchings. Okay, so how do you find minimum weight perfect matchings? It's just a simple generalization of the previous idea. Uh, so previously we had this Todd matrix which had uh, plus one, negative one, and zero entries. Now you replace those entries by uh, uh, in this uh, symbolic variable t. Uh, I raise t basically to the weight of every edge, uh, and uh, I put that instead of the plus ones and minus ones in my Todd matrix. Okay. Now if you have a perfect matching. Uh, the term that uh, that appears uh, in in the determinant of this matrix for the perfect matching is just t raised to the weight of that perfect matching, right? So if I can evaluate this as a polynomial in T, I can basically extract the lowest order term, and that gives me the number of perfect matchings of uh, the lowest possible minimum weight, uh, the lowest possible weight. Okay. So. Uh, there are many ways to do this. One very simple way of computing this as a polynomial in T is to just evaluate it at different points and then use polynomial interpolation. Okay, so you just plug in different values for T, uh, determinant you already know how to compute in NC, and then finally you, ju you just do polynomial interpolation to find the coefficients of T. Okay. So, so this this shows you a way of finding the uh, minimizer of w dot x, uh, not necessarily uh, a vertex minimizer, but some minimizer in some point in the minimizer face. Uh, but that's enough for moving inside the polytope. Okay. So now let me go to the second ingredient, uh, which is finding the tight odd sets. So the idea was that if you had a cycle and you moved along it or you exhausted it, uh, so it no longer can be, uh, so you no longer can move alongside it, then it must be either blocked by an edge or by an offset constraint. It's easy to determine whether it's blocked by an edge. Uh, you just uh, figure out whether x e is zero for any of the edges. Uh, but if that's not true, then it must be blocked by an offset. How do you find that offset? So, so you want to basically find the violate. So, you want to find the set S such that the value of the cut uh, 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 for that set S is exactly one. So, so the idea is that uh, if you if you move alongside the cycle slightly by a very tiny amount epsilon, then now you've exactly violated that constraint. And if you choose your epsilon to be small enough, you've exactly violated that constraint alone and no other constraint. Okay. So, so you move by a tiny uh, amount of epsilon along that uh, even cycle, and then you find uh, the violated constraint that, that has taken you outside of the polytope. But by, by solving this problem called the minimum odd cut problem. So in this problem, you're given uh, some, uh, some weighted graph. Now the weights are given by Xe's. And you want to find among all odd sets S, uh, the one that minimizes the cut value, right? So previously, before uh, moving along, moving outside of the polytope, uh, this minimum was exactly one, or at least one. Uh, now that you violated the constraint, this minimum has gone below one. So it's fine. So so it's enough for you to basically find the odd set that minimizes this. So, uh, so finding minimum odd cut uh, is an old problem that has been solved uh, 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 by Pat Berg and Rao. Uh, and their idea was that you can use this thing called the Gomarihu tree. Uh, so let me just uh, describe what the Gomarihu tree is. So suppose that you're given an undirected graph, it, it's potentially weighted. Uh, there is a tree on this uh, uh, undirected graph that has the same set of vertices, but whose edges do not have anything to do with the edges of the graph, right? So here is an example. You have this graph, and uh, you can find the tree on it with the with the highlighted edges. And the property that this uh, tree uh, satisfies is that all of the st cuts in the graph are given by cuts in the tree. All of the st minimum cuts in the graph are given by st cuts in the tree. 
So let me parse that for you. So given a graph, there are exactly n minus one uh, cuts defined, uh, given, given a tree, uh, there are exactly n minus one uh, cuts defined with, by the tree. Uh, the way you find the tree cut is you just remove an edge uh, of the tree, and then it just decomposes uh, the vertices into two uh, subtrees, right? Uh, so any tree defines this n minus one cuts, and the property that the gomery hu tree satisfies is that uh, this exhausts all of the minimum ST cuts for all pairs of vertices ST in the graph. Okay. So what Pat Berg and Rao showed was that not only does a Gomery Hu tree exhaust all of the ST minimum cuts, but it also exhausts the minimum odd cut. Okay. So as long as you can, you're able to construct this Gomery Hu tree, you can uh, basically try all of the n minus one cuts defined by it, and you're you're guaranteed to find the minimum odd cut. Uh, amongst those. Okay. Now, how do you how do you construct this Gomery Hu tree? There is a standard polynomial time algorithm for doing that. Uh, it just uses uh, algorithms for finding the minimum ST cuts or uh, maximum ST flow. Uh, what we showed was that uh, if you can do this in NC, which for planar graphs we can, due to a result of just Nonsense. Also construct the Gomery Hu tree in NC. Okay, so we basically took the same construction from the uh, for for polynomial time and made it into an NC algorithm. Okay. So that's how you find an odd set. So for each of your cycles, you can find an odd set that intersects it. Now the question is, if you have many different cycles and all of them give you uh, some odd set, these odd sets can be crossing each other, how do you how do you make them disjoint so that you can shrink them at the same time? So as I said, tight odd sets can cross each other arbitrarily. Uh, and this really genuinely uh, creates a problem that you can't shrink them at the same time. Uh, but there is a standard way of uncrossing, uh, which is that if you have two sets S and T that cross each other, remember these are odd sets, right? Then depending on whether or not their intersection is also odd or not, uh, you can either uncross them into S minus T and T or S union T. And both of these are guaranteed to be again tight. Okay. Uh, so the reason for the tightness of these two is that uh, is basically the submodularity of the cut function. So we have this inequality, the cut value for S plus the cut value of T is bigger than both the cut value of S intersection T plus the cut value of S union T and the cut value of S minus T and plus the cut value of T minus S, right? So if S intersection T is odd, let's say, then S union T is also odd by just the standard parity argument. So there are these two odd cuts uh, and the sum of these two odd cuts is at most the, the, the sum of the cuts values for S and T, uh, which are both guaranteed to be one because these are tight cuts, right? Uh, but these can't be lower than one, therefore both of them must be equal to one, right? The same standard uh, argument applies in the other case when S intersection T is even, uh, you, can cons you can consider S minus T and T minus S, and then both of them are gonna be tight outcuts, right? Notice that in this picture, I haven't drawn S intersection T or uh, in this case, or T minus S in this case. The reason I haven't drawn those is that uh, they are subsets of these larger sets, right? T minus S is a subset of T and S intersection T is a subset of S union T, right? At the end of the day, I wanna shrink sets. So, so sets that, that are contained inside other sets automatically get shrinked at the same time, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm only tracking the high level sets. So, so what I just said basically boils down to this, that if you have two sets that cross each other, you can either replace both of them by S union T or remove their intersection from one of the two sets, arbitrarily from either of the two sets, okay? And, uh, which, and whether you can do case one or case two only boils down to the parity, right? Uh, whether this set is odd or not, or whether this set is odd or not. And, you're guaranteed that one of these two cases happens, okay? 
All right, so you can you can you can basically uncross two two given sets, uh, but if you do this arbitrarily, it's it's uh, it might take a long time. Not not it's not even clear that it takes polynomial time, uh, let alone uh, polylogarithmic time. Um, so how do we how we how do we basically parallelize this procedure? We use a, the standard trick of uh, designing a divide and conquer algorithm. So, so what's the goal of uh, this problem? You're given some uh, odd sets S1 through SM that cross each other on arbitrarily, and the goal is to uncross them, output a set, uh, disjoint set of uh, odd tight sets that basically span the original ones. So you can basically divide this list into two roughly equal sized halves, uh, and then uncross them recursively uh, to get P1 through PK and Q1 through KL. Right now, the only type of intersection that remains is between a PI and a QJ. Right, these sets are already uncrossed. These sets are already uncrossed, so you only have PI and QJ intersections. Right. So the last step is to basically remove these intersections. Okay. Now, uh, this merge procedure is where the meat of the argument is. Uh, you can basically distill all of the information about PIs and QJs into this thing called the intersection parity graph. Okay. So this on the one side you have PIs, on the other side you have the QJs, and then you put an uh, edge between a PI and a QJ when they have an odd intersection, and you put a non-edge when they have an even intersection. Right. The point is that PIs and QJs have no tree-wise intersections because if you pick any three sets, two of them are going to be uh, either on the PI side or on the QJ side. Therefore, the intersection is empty, and uh, uh, and and you only care about the parities of the intersections or the parities of the uh, the regions in the Venn diagram of these sets. Uh, and, and this graph basically captures all of those parities. So you can distill all of the information you need into this bipartite graph formed by the PIs and QJs. Okay. So, so now given such a graph, how do you, how do you uncross it? Lucky equation, which we can hope for. Uh, remember that one of the two operations uh, we could do for uncrossing was taking the union, right? So in the in the previous graph here, I can basically uncross by merging p p1 with q1, then merging the result with p2, then merging the result with q2. All uh, and all the time, I'm just taking the union, right? So the lucky situation would be if I could do this uh, for my graph and take the union of all of the odd sets, right? So there are two things that basically uh, uh, prevent you from doing this. Um, one is that if my graph is disconnected, then I can no longer, uh, then I can't, then I can't do this and I can never basically, uh, take the union of two things from two different connected components because there would be never an edge between, uh, any sets I get from one connected component and the, and, uh, any set I get from another connected component. So this is needed. There is also one other thing which is needed, which is that the, this union, if I if I want it to be an odd tight set, it better be odd, right? So the parity of this union is basically the same as the parity of the number of edges plus the number of vertices on my graph. This is a standard parity argument. So this is also needed for the, the whole union to be an odd, a tight odd set. And what we showed was that these are the only things needed. So if you have a graph that's connected, uh, and whose number of edges plus the number of vertices is odd, then you can take the union and the union is an odd tight set. The way you prove such a thing is by induction. You basically find subgraphs that satisfy again the, the same properties. And then uh, you, you, you find two subgraphs that satisfy, satisfy the same properties. And then uh, you show that you can uh, merge uh, each subgraph into one set and then take the union of the two subgraphs. Now, if my graph is connected, but uh, but the second condition is not satisfied, in other words, the this whole set is even, uh, then there is a slightly uh, a more tricky thing that you can do, which is to find two subgraphs for which uh, for which the number of edges plus the number of vertices is odd, and you can basically uh, get two sets as the output of this procedure. 
right? So for every connected component in my graph, I can either merge it into a single set or two sets, right? Now, the point is that once you do this, uh, the rest of the problem is easy because now my graph is basically empty. Uh, I no longer have any, any odd intersections between my sets. And now you can just basically uh, order your sets and remove the intersections of sets one through i from set i plus first. Okay. So removing intersections is a trivial operation. Um, and and uh, uh, these two lemmas allow you to uh, get to, to a situation where you only have to remove the intersections. So that's how you uncross. Okay. Now, uh, if you've seen the three main ingredients I've I've shown, you might be tempted to try this algorithm, uh, which is you find many many even cycles. So this is a recap of the ingredients. So you you try to you try uh, to find many many edge disjoint cycles. Uh, then you move alongside all of them at the same time by finding a weight vector, and then from each cycle you have either removed an edge or you found a tight outset uh, crossing it, basically. So if you removed many edges, you just recurse on the remaining graph, as in the bipartite case. If you didn't remove many edges, you found many odd sets, you uncross them, and then you shrink the uncrossed sets. So uh, uh, from the graph on the top, I get to this graph, which has only four vertices, right? Now in the shrunk graph, I find the perfect matching, and then I extend this perfect matching into each of the shrunk pieces to, a, to get a perfect matching in the whole graph, right? The thing that's guaranteed is that uh, this shrinking procedure uh, reduces the size of my graph by a constant factor, so, so the recursion depth here is logarithmic. But here's a problem with this procedure. The problem is that even though the recursion depth is logarithmic, the time it takes is not polylogarithmic. And the reason is that there is an inherent sequentiality here. Uh, so I have to find the perfect matching in this shrunk graph before I can extend it into the shrink, uh, into the shrunk pieces, right? So I can't, I can't go and look ahead and basically extend the matching in each of the shrunk pieces because I don't know which edge of the uh, which which external edge I'm using, okay? So so this algorithm is not polylogarithmic, uh, but there is a fix to it, which is uh, suppose that if uh, when I when I uncrossed all of my odd sets, I didn't find many many odd sets, but I only found uh, one giant odd set. So this is a this is a, what I call a balanced tight odd set. So an odd set because inside and outside are both linear in the number of vertices, right? Now, uh, if you have uh, this balanced odd tight set, you can basically decompose your problem into two uh, independent problems and recurse on that. But how do you find such a balanced tight odd set? The idea is you the same as before by finding many small pieces of odd sets. Uh, and reduce the size of the graph multiple times. So from uh, the graph on the left, I go, I go to the middle one. In the middle one, I find two odd sets. I shrink them again. Uh, and if I do this many, many times, I get to a constant size graph. Let's say a graph with 100 nodes. Now, one of the, one of the nodes in this 100 node graph must contain at least 1% of the original vertices. So I've, I've highlighted that by this uh, ACDEF node in the, in the last graph, right? Now, if you if you unshrink all of the things that we shrunk, this gives you an odd set in the original graph, right? And this odd set is balanced. Uh, it has a linear number of vertices inside and outside. Uh, now you can basically um, decompose your problem into two pieces uh, by just selecting an edge, uh, crossing this uh, single odd set, and uh, just extending the single edge into each of the each of the pieces that has a uh, whose, whose whose sizes have been reduced by a constant factor. Okay, so so that's basically the whole algorithm. Um, so a couple of notes. Uh, I'm I think I'm running out of time. Do I have a couple more minutes, or should I just uh, go to the end of this slide? No, I 
I think if you are the conclusion slides, you should you should yeah. take the time to okay. go to go over right. them. We can we can go sure. over them. Sure. All right. So so the same ideas can be extended to find a minimum weight perfect matching, not just a perfect matching, but a minimum weight one, as long as the weights are polynomially uh, bounded. Okay. Now there are exactly three places where I used planarity of the graph. Uh, one was to count perfect matchings. Uh, one was to find uh, linearly many edge disjoint cycles, and one was to uh, uh, find uh, maximum ST flows. So all of these three places, uh, you, you can do the same three operations for uh, bounded genus graphs. So basically the whole algorithm works uh, for bounded genus graphs as well. And then, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, recently uh, it has also been uh, uh, extended to this class called one crossing minor free graphs. So this, uh, the, the graphs in this class are not, are not necessarily bounded genus. And here are a bunch of open questions. Um, so the main open question is, uh, is planarity needed? Uh, whether or not the matching problem in non-planar graphs can be found, uh, uh, can be solved in NC. So here the decision problem is not solved either, right? So that's the main question. Uh, so this weird problem of, uh, remember the red blue graph, uh, uh, the, the red blue matching problem uh, called the exact matching. Uh, we don't even know a polynomial time deterministic algorithm for it. So if you don't, uh, if you're not very interested in parallel algorithms, you can think about this problem. Um, so uh, as I said, maximum cardinality matching in general can be reduced to perfect matching, but the reduction doesn't preserve planarity. So uh, in a surprising uh, result, Sankowski has recently shown that if you have bipartite planar graphs, uh, then you can solve the maximum cardinality matching problem by reducing it to uh, non-bipartite planar perfect matching. Okay, but the but the question is still open for maximum cardinality in uh, in non-bipartite planar graphs. Okay, uh, and then uh, the the final question, which I think might be slightly easier than the rest, is uh, exact matching in planar graphs, right? Because you can count uh, matchings in planar graphs, you can also solve uh, uh, exact matching the decision version uh, or even the counting version uh, in planar graphs. Uh, but can you solve the search problem for exact matching in planar graphs in NC? And that's the end of the talk, thanks. Okay, thanks, Neil. Um, so if there's questions, um, speak up or type something in the in the chat. So the reason you put a single cup for the last uh, question is that yeah, um, you solve it <laughs> that's already, that's or? my evaluation of how many uh, how much coffee you need to solve those problems. But <laughs> it's okay. A, so even the hard ones are not that bad, right? So. <laughs> um, uh, you have to scale it by something, but yeah. questions. I mean, do you want? Do you have anything more to say about the first question? So, is it? I mean, you you said where you said things about how planarity is used. Um, yeah. So, but does it mean this is a wild? You, know, you think that this is? There's no way you can go build on uh, top of what you have been doing. Um, so, so the reason that uh, so okay, so I'll I'll maybe say a, a few things about the first question. So, the two recent developments uh, of uh, have been about this problem, and they've shown that uh, matching in non by non planar graphs can be solved in quasi NC, right? So the way they work is by just de-randomizing the, the so-called isolation lemma, yeah. right? So the isolation lemma is that um, you want to find uh, random weights such that, and that's basically the only way we can these problems, right? Uh, we, we don't know of a way to basically uh, reduce the, the there, there is no known way, so, so, what what the what the two papers have shown is that you can find quasi polynomially many weight uh, functions, one of which is guaranteed to isolate a perfect matching, yeah. right? Uh, 
uh, I think it's uh, that's that's the main hurdle. Uh, you, the only way we know how to attack these problems is by the isolation lemma, and uh, and it's not likely that there are polynomially many weights that that uh, 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 that basically isolate a perfect matching uh, uh, in a graph. So the the weights the weight functions they uh, they construct uh, are sort of oblivious to the graph. Uh, the weight yeah. functions. Uh, do not do not even look at the graph, and they're just uh, quasi polynomial. Many of them, you can just try all of them. Uh, I think if you want to be oblivious, it might not even be possible to isolate a uh, perfect matching. Um, uh, yeah. But there's no lower bounds of that form. Like, are there lower bounds on? Uh, I'm not sure form? exactly. Uh, I think I think if you're not talking about uh, perfect matchings, but uh, slightly a uh, more general class of polytopes, uh, then there are known lower bounds. Uh, not really sure whether uh, the same holds for perfect matchings or not. Oh, someone has a question. Maybe can you read it, Nima, or maybe I'll read it for everyone. Can you mention mm -hmm. um, which of these open questions are still open questions? Um, I see, even if you allow randomization. Uh, I see, so none of them. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, none of them are open uh, when you allow randomization. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have other questions? Okay, if not, maybe I'll uh, uh, take us offline. So thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks again, Nima, for giving the talk. Um, a couple of weeks from now, we'll have Artur Humas um, from Warwick telling us about uh, round compression. Um, okay, so thanks everyone for joining and uh, see you in a, in a couple of weeks. Thanks.